So at first glance, this trig identity problem doesn't really seem to be that complex. There's a few reciprocal trig expressions thrown in there, but that's really nothing you can't handle if you've been studying trig identities. You may recall that with trig identity problems, I usually recommend picking on the most complex side and starting with that one. In this case, I'm gonna say the left side is more complex. I don't like that I have reciprocal expressions here, and I also have subtraction. And usually with trig identities, when you have subtraction or addition, you end up with a more complex problem than if you didn't. Kind of counterintuitive, but that's just the way these things work. In addition to that, the right-hand side doesn't really have anything that I can simplify. I've got everything in terms of cosine already, and that's usually one of the first steps I take, is writing everything in terms of sine and cos. So I'm going to jump back over to the left-hand side. I can apply my reciprocal trig identities to write cosecant as 1 over sine of x, and I'm subtracting cotangent, which I could call cos over sine. And that's just one of those reciprocal identities that you likely know if you're watching this video. So what I have here is a subtraction of two fractions, which is usually kind of scary. But because I have a common denominator, this really isn't that complex of a problem. I can keep the numerator the same, subtracting 1 minus cos of x, and I can divide that by the common denominator of sine of x. Because my original expression was squared, I can just write out two of these being multiplied by each other. Okay, so at this point, I can apply the FOIL process to multiply 1 by 1 and get 1. I can multiply 1 by negative cos to get negative cos of x. I can multiply negative cos of x times 1 to get negative cos of x. And I can multiply negative cos of x times negative cos of x to get positive cos of x squared. And of course, I've still got my denominator of sine of x. At this point, it makes sense to sort of take inventory of what we have in the numerator. I have negative cos of x minus cos of x. I know that to be negative 2 cos of x. And I've still got this plus cos squared x on the end. And of course, I'm still dividing by sine of x. So this is that inevitable part in every trig identity problem where you look at what you have and you just have absolutely no idea how to progress. This is also the part where you have to use a very bizarre trick that you'd never really know about unless I showed you in this video, which I'm doing right now. I'm going to rearrange the terms in the numerator so that the degree on the cosines are decreasing from 2 to 1 to 0. And when I do that, you're going to see something kind of interesting happen. This kind of looks like a quadratic expression. If you don't see it, bear with me. Imagine for a moment that I let u equal cos of x. So in my quadratic expression here, wherever I see a cos x, I'm going to put a u. That would mean that I'd have u squared minus 2u plus 1, which more obviously resembles a quadratic expression. As it turns out, this quadratic expression can be factored into u minus 1 times u minus 1. However, you'll recall that u equals cos of x. Making that substitution results in the following expression. So from this, I can conclude that my quadratic expression over here factors into this. Moving over to this side of the board, you can see that I've replaced my quadratic expression with a factor form expression in the numerator. So I may have got rid of this ugly quadratic, but I'm still not really close to proving this trig identity. You can see in the right-hand side, I have a cos on top and a cos on the bottom. I definitely have a cos on top, but I don't have a cos on the bottom. I can fix that by applying the Pythagorean identity to change sine squared x into 1 minus cos squared x. This is probably an identity you've worked with before if you're watching something like this. Recall that 1 minus cos squared x could be factored using difference of squares factoring, resulting in 1 minus cos x times 1 plus cos x. Now this is great for a few reasons. I've got multiplication of expressions in the numerator and the denominator, which means I can start canceling things. However, my expressions in the numerator and the denominator are not entirely equivalent at this point, so I can't simply cancel just yet. The other good news is I've ended up with a 1 plus cos x in the denominator, which I know eventually I should end up with based on what's shown on the right-hand side. Now here's another step that I think makes this trig identity problem quite difficult. I mentioned that you can't simply cancel the numerator and the denominator. On top I have cos x minus 1, and on the bottom I have 1 minus cos x. Those are not equivalent expressions. Yet, if I use my keen sense of mathematical intuition to common factor a negative out of the brackets, I can switch all of the signs of this expression, resulting in negative, negative cos x plus 1. If I switch these two terms, I end up with 1 minus cos x in this set of brackets, which is what I have in the denominator. At this point, I'm allowed to cancel out these two expressions because I'm multiplying in both the numerator and the denominator. With those two expressions gone and this negative still living in front of my expression, I end up with something like this. Now, if I distribute this negative into the brackets, I end up with negative cos of x plus 1 in the numerator. And at this point, we reach the most satisfying part of this trig identity problem. I can switch the two terms in the numerator to end up with 1 minus cos of x over 1 plus cos of x, which is the same as the right-hand side. So again, at first glance, this trig identity problem doesn't really seem to be that complex. 
However, our need for a new substitution and this bizarre common factoring of a negative really amplify the difficulty of this problem. And of course, as a reflective problem solver, I'm looking back at my work and I'm realizing there's a way to solve this problem that does not involve that bizarre u substitution step. So I'll walk you through that quickly. From this point in my solution, if I keep the numerator the same but multiply sine times sine in the denominator, I get sine squared. Now I can apply the Pythagorean identity to rewrite the denominator as 1 minus co squared, just like I did in my original solution. Next, I can factor the denominator using the difference of squares factoring method. And you'll see that I can cancel out these two expressions, as they're the same in the numerator and the denominator. Okay, I know this is way simpler, but I really just wanted to show you how to use a u substitution in a trig identity problem, because I think that's a totally awesome and useful skill. If you have questions about this solution, or you've seen a more complex trig identity problem than this, leave me a note in the comments and I'll be sure to check it out. Thanks for watching.